Good evening. Uh, welcome uh, to this special lecture tonight. I want to say at the beginning we meet on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Uh, my name is Richard Topping and I'm the principal of the Vancouver School of Theology. Uh, we're really glad for your attendance here this evening at the David Somerville Lecture. Archbishop Somerville was a friend of the Vancouver School of Theology and through a bequest from his estate uh, and the generosity of his friends, this lecture to promote spiritual vitality and community leadership was made possible. Uh, Bishop, Archbishop Somerville contributed to the life of the Vancouver School of Theology in many ways. He was a student at the Anglican Theological College, which is a predecessor of the Vancouver School of Theology. He was professor of pastoral theology for five years, and following his retirement as a bishop, he became an Anglican chaplain at the school. He devoted most of his life to parishes and communities in British Columbia, exercising the kind of progressive and innovative leadership that led to a description of him as a quiet radical at his consecration as a bishop. Uh, tonight, we're blessed with a wonderful speaker and three wonderful panelists. Uh, Professor Wurzba will speak to us on the theme of eating more than a matter of life and death. And then a panelist will, three panelists, will offer five to seven minute responses to his address. And Professor Wurzba can then uh, address anything in their comments that he would like. And then we will take questions from those gathered here this evening. Uh, I just want to encourage you when it comes to questions to form your question in the form of a question. And please try and come to the point and ask your questions so that we can have as many people as possible participate in that part of the evening. Let me introduce our panelists first of all. Um, Andrea Parrott is a dietitian and a pastor. She loves exploring the connection between physical health and spiritual health and what that can mean for Christian communities. She's the re director of a church planting network through St. Andrew's Hall. She has a Master of Divinity from the esteemed institution of the Vancouver School of Theology, where she has returned to do a THM in missional theology. Uh, she enjoys road biking and taking her goofy black lab on canoe trips. Trevor Malkinson uh, did a BA and MA in philosophy and was a chef for 20 years to pay the bills. He graduated from Vancouver School of Theology in 2016 and has been ordained in the United Church of Canada since 2017. He's currently acting director of the West Coast Center for Revolutionary Theology, and he lives in Courtney, BC with his wife and two young children. Finally, Karen Gisbrook is a registered dietitian with a particular interest in mental health, strong communities, good stories, and real food. Uh, she wove all these together in her book, Happy Colon, Happy Soul, an exploration of why and how we share food. At home in Vancouver, Canada, Karen takes great delight in sharing meals with her family, friends, and those in her community who know hunger. Finally, our speaker for this evening, it's my pleasure to introduce him, uh, uh, Professor Norman Wurzba. He pursues uh, research and teaching interests at the intersection of theology, philosophy, ecology, agrarian, and environmental studies. He lectures frequently in Canada, which is his home. He's from Alberta, in the United States and Europe. His research is centered on the recovery of the doctrine of creation and a restatement of humanity in terms of its creaturely life. He's currently the director of a multi-year Henry Luce Foundation funded project entitled Facing the Anthropocene. Uh, in this project, housed at Duke's Ken Keenan Institute for Ethics, he's working with an international team of scholars to rethink several academic disciplines in light of challenges like climate change, food insecurity, biotechnology, genetic engineering, artificial intelligence, species extinction, and the built environment. That's quite a combination of things. Professor Wurzba has published quite a number of books too, including The Paradise of God, Living the Sabbath, Way of Love, From Nature to Creation, and he's co-edited some collections with others, Making Peace with the Land. He also edited The Essential Agrarian Reader and The Art of the Commonplace. Uh, Professor Wurzba serves as general editor for the book series Culture of the Land, a series in the new agrarianism. 
published by the University Press of Kentucky, and he's co-founder and executive committee member of the Society for Continental Philosophy and Theology. Uh, finally, let me say a personal word. Uh, Professor Wurzba came to the church where I was minister in downtown Montreal probably 12 years ago now, and I could persuade them of very little. Um, he did a great job, came and, and spoke about uh, the importance of practices around uh, our purchasing food and got a downtown congregation to start a cooperative and they actually had uh, farmers bringing in a, a market uh, in downtown Montreal uh, because the, he used the line where he said, you know, we don't want to marinate our vegetables in gasoline. That sounded really unappetizing to the people at the church, and they decided to, to found this cooperative, which was a great success in the city. So I'm grateful to him for his influence in a congregation where I was minister. I love what he does in his presentations because there's always this practical part. There's a way you don't feel defeated when he's done. You feel like there's something you could do uh, to participate more faithfully in God's good world. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, Professor Norman Wurzba. All right, thank you. Can you all hear me all right? Yes? Okay. Uh, maybe we need a little bit more. Yeah, we, we, people are saying we need to have a little bit more. Unless I say bad things, then we can turn it down. Uh, so first of all, let me just say how great it is to be here. Uh, whenever Richard calls, I always say yes. Um, so, so thank you, it's, it's a delight to be here. Uh, there's so many things that we could be talking about when we talk about food, so I have to try to find a way to, to give us something that would be so, fairly memorable, I hope, but also something that will help us think about the very large frame in which we think about our eating and the way we think about our food. And so I wanna start by making an observation which I hope will be a bit startling to you, and that is that we are living in an experiment in the history of humanity right now because for the very first time in the history of the world, most people need to know almost nothing about where their food comes from. Right? Do, you, do you realize how new this is in the history of humanity? I mean, today, most people don't need to know a thing about where food comes from or what needs to be done for food to be available to eat. You don't have to do anything. All you gotta do is go to a grocery store, and if you don't wanna do that, all you gotta do is have a smartphone. And you can just scroll through the options, fill up a cart, and it'll show up at your door. That's incredible, right? If you would have told people even 100 years ago that one day somebody's gonna give you one of these little things and you'll just open it up and you'll click and it'll show up, they would have said that's impossible. It just doesn't work that way. But soon they're gonna bring it into your house, they'll put it in your kitchen, they'll cook it for you, they'll even put it in your mouth for you. <laughs> Won't that be great? So you'll have to do even nothing. Maybe they'll even digest it for you. Because I think the point is to make your whole body useless. Uh, I don't know, that's just being silly. But it's truly remarkable that this is a situation in which so many people find ourselves in. And I know that there will be communities of people and regions in the world where this is not the story. Because we know that there are a lot of people who don't have access to food. We know that there are places where the food is not available for people to purchase even if they had the money. So I'm going to be talking mostly about the dominant conventional food system because this is the system that is so powerful in its effects in the world and it's also the food system that is being exported all around the world and is highly sought by many people in the world today. And it's the system that's going to have the most effect on communities and the planet's well-being going into the future. So having started with that observation, we now need to say, well, who are we as eaters of food? How do we come to eat at all? And the way that happens for many people now is to be a shopper of food. Again, this is, this is quite unusual. You know that we didn't have the thing called the grocery store until fairly recently. We've had markets for a good long time, 
but we didn't have grocery stores. And in America and in Canada, I think, the typical grocery store has anywhere between 30 and 50,000 food products. And all you got to do is walk down the aisles and you can see all of these products for you to buy. Now, as a shopper of food, you have the most ignorant relationship with the world that human beings have had because as a shopper of food, again, you don't need to know anything. All you have to do is look at what the sort of company or the average gets us as shoppers. Another big one, of course, is convenience. Now, when you go into a grocery store, it's not that you'll see just the regular kinds of whole foods, dairy, produce, and so forth that are on the outside aisles and then all the box things. Have you noticed that there's a proliferation of prepared foods? The grab and go counters and things of that sort? Because as eaters, we want food to be convenient. So we don't have to spend a lot of time preparing the meals that we're actually going to eat. So convenience is a big one. And another really big one is cheapness of price. So I need to tell you, I grew up in southern Alberta, and we were farmers. And I grew up with farming community people. And all the years of my life growing up, my farmer friends kept saying, why can't people pay an honest price for food? Okay, this is a big, big deal. And you need to understand how, how visceral this feeling is about pricing. And I can explain it to you this way. When my grandfather moved to Western Canada in 1952 and started growing wheat, when he took a bushel to sell it at the, at the grain elevator, he got 375 for that bushel of wheat. If he were selling a bushel of wheat today at that same elevator, what do you think he would get paid? Any guesses? So we're almost 70 years later. 375. Okay, now think about that. He's getting the exact same price for the wheat that he is selling 70 years later. Everything else that he needs to grow that bushel of wheat has gone up in price several thousand percent. And he's still getting paid the same amount. Okay? This is why farmers were constantly saying, when are people going to pay the real price? Because you could have a banner year, bumper crops, and the farmer will say, I might break even this year. How many of you would work your whole life, your whole year, every day, to lose money, right? Would you do it? But this is what we're asking farmers to do in many instances, so that if there aren't subsidy payments, they really don't make anything. So we have to ask about this, this lure of cheapness that has got us. And to show you how powerful this is, you know, my parents and family and I, we farmed, and then when my parents got older, they retired and moved into town. And then we came as our family to visit them one weekend. And I said on a Saturday morning, hey, mom, let's go to the farmer's market in the exhibition grounds. Andy knows what I'm talking about. So my mom says, why? And I said, well, mom, it's great. It's a farmer's market. It's just great. You get to see all this great fresh food and farmers. And you know what she said to me? The prices are so high. I said, Mom, all the years growing up, you kept saying, when are people going to pay the real price for food? She's off the farm, but a couple of years, and she's already looking for the deal. Because that's how we are as people, right? My mom's not a mean-spirited person. I love my mom. But we all want a deal. And what this means, of course, is that as consumers, we have become the kinds of eaters who are constantly thinking about price, availability, quantity, convenience. And this now has become our default spirituality. We go through life wanting it on our terms and as cheaply and conveniently as possible. And so it's no surprise that fast food 
has become one of the ways that we best describe the culture of the eating in which many of us operate. Now this desire to have food cheaply, conveniently, in terms of its availability, what it's reflecting is again a fairly new way of thinking about what food actually is. And I would say that the best way to characterize this is to describe food as a commodity. Right? And what I mean by food as a commodity is a description of food in terms of its availability, made available through processes of efficiency and profitability. Okay? The emphasis is always going to be on maximization of yield. And I think we'd all have to agree that in several respects this has been a good thing. And we can associate it with a development that I think many of you know about. It's called the Green Revolution. Anybody not heard about the Green Revolution? Okay, this is very, very important. It was founded by a guy named Norman. Not worse, but Borlaug. An agricultural scientist who after the Second World War He's starting his career, he's thinking, wait a minute, you know, we've learned that there are going to be several billion people coming, and if you look at food production as it's happening now, it's not looking like we're going to be able to feed all these people. So he worked mostly in Central America to develop new varieties of grains. Wheat was where he started, but his techniques were developed in relation to other crops as well, especially corn. And his idea was if we can get new seed varieties, combine that with more irrigation and also the application of fertilizers and herbicides, we can increase yields. And he was successful. It was remarkable. So if you had a wheat field that was producing 40 bushels an acre, he got it to 100. And since then they got it even higher, 120, 130. And corn went from like 60 bushels an acre 250. It's incredible, right? And for good reason, Norman Borlaug won the Nobel Peace Prize. That's an astounding thing for an agricultural scientist to win the Peace Prize. And the reason he did is because without his innovations in agriculture, millions of people would have starved. So it's huge. We all are glad about the fact that our caloric output over the last several decades has grown tremendously. But what we haven't appreciated well enough is that the Green Revolution could just as well have been called the Brown Revolution because it depends thoroughly on the use of fossil fuels. It's dependent upon a system in which you have to use oil or gas, right? not just to drive the machinery, but to make the machinery, right? To fix the ammonia that becomes the nitrogen that is the fertilizer that you put in the ground. And this becomes a big problem because we've got this thing called climate change. Today's industrial agricultural practices contribute anywhere between 30 and 40% of the greenhouse gases. We've also learned that this green revolution also depends upon a lot of irrigated water. And the question is, are we going to have this water for long? We don't have a lot of fresh water in the world. You wouldn't know it because there's these oceans that are mostly what's covering our planet. And it's a lot of water, but it's not the water we can use. And the fresh water that we do have, a lot of it is concentrated in a few places, like the Great Lakes region. So the irrigation water that we need to grow the food is often not available. We're also discovering that the soil that has been growing all of this food is being systematically degraded by the steady application of poisons, steady application of synthetic fertilizers. Because the Green Revolution is a monoculture system in which you grow the same crop year after year after year. And as it's drawing up all the nutrients, the soil is becoming exhausted. This is a system that's based upon control and manipulation. And as I said, it's been very successful in producing more calories than the world has ever known. 
But we're also beginning to realize that this can't be a long-term solution because it's a system that depends upon wanting to increase yields on increasing degradation of soils, pollution and depletion of fresh water, and also the indebtedness of agricultural workers. What we've seen as this revolution has taken hold in different places of the world is that farmers are taking on so much debt to try to do the work of producing the food that you and I need to eat that the debt is actually driving them out of business or it's driving them to suicide. We don't talk very much about agricultural suicide, but it's happening in alarming numbers still. So we have to wonder, can this be a strategy for success going into the future if this is what we think food is going to do, that it's going to poison our, our waters and our soils, it's going to degrade, exhaust our agricultural communities, render our farmers in greater and greater debt. We've got dietitians, so we'll be able to talk a little bit about the health of this much more industrialized, highly processed diet, right? So this is a description about food as a commodity. Is this the way we want to think about what food is? I want to suggest to you that this is a highly impoverished imagination for food. Now why? And what might be a better way to think about food? How we name food matters. If you think about food as a commodity, and you positioned as a shopper of that commodity, there are certain logics that are inevitably going to be in play. Which is just another way of saying that how you name things determines how you're going to relate to them. So I'll do a little experiment with you so you can see how this works. Imagine that I'm holding a plant in my hand. And I tell you that this plant is a flower. Okay, it's a gardenia. You all imagining it? What do you want to do when you see a gardenia plant? Yeah, you want to come close. You want to smell it because gardenias smell like, like heaven. But then I say, wait a minute, I made a mistake. The plant, it's not really a gardenia. It's a weed. Now what are you thinking? <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Misidentification, yes. But what's the response? Come on, you're being polite. Kill it. Don't just pull it. You want to kill it because as Monsanto says, well, Bayer now, weeds steal the sunshine. And they steal the moisture in your soil. So weeds you want to eradicate. But then I say, no, no, no sorry, I'm a little confused tonight. It's not a flower. It's not a weed. It's actually a blooming tomato plant. Now what are you thinking? Well, you got to be patient, though, because it's just flowered. So, you know, you got to tie it, you got to sucker it. And after a few weeks, you're going to get vine ripe tomatoes. And that's a flavor explosion in your head, right? So notice one plant, three different namings three radically different responses to it. A flower is the kind of thing you want to behold. A weed is the kind of thing you want to eradicate. And a tomato is the kind of thing you want to take care of. Food as a commodity evokes a, a kind of response in you. So what would a different naming do? And my point will be to say that if you name food differently, and believe it, it ought to cause a different response in you too. So what's this other naming likely to be? How about if we say that food is not a commodity and instead say that food is a gift? Right? What's the difference between naming food as a commodity versus food as a gift? What should your response be that'll be different? 
Right? So think first about the posture. A commodity, you come into the store like this. Right? Because I'm going to come and I'm going to grasp. I'm going to take hold. I'm going to put it in my shopping basket, pay my money, and I'm gone because it's now mine. If you're offering a gift to somebody, what's the proper posture? Is it to come like this? No. If you've had children, <laughs> You, you always work on this with them, right? You try to help them understand that, you know, you, you come to a gift like this, right? A receiving posture becomes something very, very important for you to learn. Now, what does this mean sort of more broadly construed when we talk about food as a gift? Why would we even speak this way? Because you're still going to go into a grocery store. It'll still be there. You'll still pay for it. So why do you mean talk about this as a gift? Well, you have to think about the experience of somebody who isn't a shopper of food, but somebody who's actually a producer of food. Right? This is why what I started with is really, really important. Remember how I said we are the most ignorant eaters of food the world has ever known because we don't have to know anything about food and we don't have to do anything to get our food. But if you grow food, any gardeners in the room? Oh, good. Any hunters in the room? Okay, how about gatherers? Okay, those have been the major, major ways of people feeding themselves, right? Hunting, gathering, or farming, or gardening. Each of them are very active, bodily engaged relationships with the sources of our food. They're all embodied engagements that require a tremendous amount of intelligence. Because think, if you're a gatherer, you want to find the food you're gathering at its moment of highest nutritional value, right? Ripeness. So that means you've got to know where everything is and when it's ready to be eaten. And here's the thing. Just as you know that, every other critter knows it too. So you've got to get there before the other critters do. Otherwise, you're not going to get it. And if you don't get it, guess what happens? You die. It's pretty simple. And the same with hunting. You have to remember, the hunters we're talking about, they didn't have high-powered rifles. They often ran down their prey. I don't know why I'm getting all this ticking sound. Is there something I need to do? OK, is this going to work better, you think? We'll try. All right, so even as a hunter, you had to have a pretty profound understanding of the animals that you're trying to hunt. And here's the other thing. We know from indigenous peoples that the hunting that they did also assumed something like a moral relationship to what you hunted. So think about it this way. Anthropologists, when they went up to northern Canada and started talking with Inuit people, and they'd say, you know, you all hunt whales, right? It's your main source of food and energy. And they say, how do you do it? And they say, what do you mean, how do we do it? Well, you've just got these flimsy little kayaks or canoes. And you go out into the ocean and you hunt whales? I mean, these whales, they can destroy you very simply. And they say, yeah. And they say, well, how do you do it? And they say, well, the whales, they offer themselves to us. And anthropologist said, what could you possibly mean by that? And they said, well, a hunter, before going out to hunt a whale, goes through a process of moral discernment and purification so that if they are immoral in their relationships with others, meaning maybe they're not treating their family well, they're not taking care of their home or their habitat, the whales simply won't offer themselves. So when you go out, a whale offers itself to you? He says, yeah, the whales, they come beside the boat and they just offer themselves to us and we know we can hunt them then. Now think about the kind of 
affinity of relationship that's going on in that description of what the hunting enterprise can be. It's not an exercise of you know getting in your pickup truck and then from hundreds of yards away shooting an animal down. Right? There's this acknowledgement of relationality that's happening here, which again presupposes a very intimate kind of relationship. And the same thing happens if you're a gardener or a farmer. As gardeners, you know you can prepare a seed bed, get the best seed that you can, some heirloom variety or whatever you're doing, put it in the ground, water it, and you still will have no guarantee that you'll have either germination, that you'll have growth, that you'll have harvest. And why? Because so many things can go wrong. So many things can go wrong. To be a gardener or a farmer is to have to face daily your own ignorance and your own impotence. That's really difficult. But in the meantime, you still have to be the kind of person who's constantly attentive, constantly engaged, trying to be as patient as you can and as caring as you can. But in the end, you know that if you have tomatoes at all, they came to you from beyond your comprehension and control. Okay, so the experiences of gathering and hunting and farming and gardening, they teach you over and over again that insofar as you eat at all, it's because of a fundamental generosity that seems to be at play in the world. And this is the kind of thing that so many of us do not have if we are simply the shoppers of food. I don't know if you all know this book by Robin Kimmerer, Kimmerer called Braiding Sweetgrass. Have any of you heard of this book? It's a fabulous book. She's become a friend through this Anthropocene project, just the most beautiful person. And in her book, she describes how she thinks one of the fundamental psychoses of modern industrial peoples is that they live in a land and because they only came to the land to control it and possess it have never had the experience of loving the land by giving your care and devotion to it and then feeling the love of the land back to us. She says living in a world where you don't know in some visceral way how the land doesn't just sort of prop up your feet, but actually loves you by giving you the sustenance that you need. And not just sustenance, giving you a world that is beautiful, a world that can taste incredibly good. Not having that experience leads to all kinds of psychic disturbance. And the best analogy might be if you know somebody or maybe if you yourself have experienced living, growing up, being raised in a home where you never feel love or sense love, the kind of damage that does to people. So what happens if you're just the shopper of food and you live in a world where you never experience food as the expression of a fundamental generosity and love? It's a gift. If you cook food or you bake, I think you have a little bit of appreciation for this. When I was young, my grandmother loved to feed me. And not just me, but everybody. Maybe you had a grandmother like this. I would show up at her house and she would immediately sit me down at the kitchen table and put some food in front of me. And often I would eat it because it was really good, right? But sometimes I would show up having just eaten. And so I'd say, Oma, I can't eat. I'm full. I just ate. And she'd say, no, Norman, you must eat. And I'd say, Oma, I can't. I'm just so full. I really can't eat. And she'd say, no, eat. And I'd say, I can't. And then she'd cry. Now, why did she cry? 
Yes. I did not receive her love. Because when you cook for somebody, you express your love for them. Right? I hope you all have that experience. Imagine you invite a whole bunch of people to your house, you make a big fancy dinner, and you sit down at the table with them, and none of them will eat it. It's really awkward. <laughs> right? You would never want that because you put in the time to make this meal because in making the meal for somebody, you're expressing to them your concern for them, your love for them, your desire to want to nurture them. There's a theological way to put all this, right? The whole creation is God's declaration of love. Think about God as the primordial cook. We need to be astounded by the fact that we live in a world in which everything that lives has to eat. This may not seem like a really big deal until you get involved in the growing of your food. Because when you grow your food, you know that for anything to eat, others have to die. That's just inescapable. And if you think that because you're a vegetarian, you're somehow off the hook, that's wrong. Try to grow a garden of just vegetables and encounter all the death that's going on. Now, I grant, not all deaths are the same, but this world depends upon the eating of each other for life to carry on, which means that death is not simply the end of your life, it is life's steadfast accomplice. And without it, none of us, not a single thing, would live. Which means then, for God to have made a world in which creatures have to eat to live ought to terrify us. Because you could imagine that God would have said, it's a whole lot less messy if we don't have to eat. Because then nothing has to consume anything else. And nothing has to die so that something else can live. It's a whole lot neater. But that's not the world we have. And so for God to create a world in which creatures have to eat each other to live means that the way we are supposed to live with each other is through this fundamental mode of the giving of love and the receiving of love. And one of the ways we can describe this is to say that God's way of creating a world and maintaining life is through this incredible costly exercise of hospitality. Right? So what God does is first creates a space for another to be itself, to be other. That's what we mean when we say that God creates things. But then what God does is God welcomes this other into this divine hospitality of nurture. And the nurturing is so that you can now be empowered to be more fully yourself. So hospitality, I know we got, I'm living in the South now. So we got a magazine called Southern Living. And there's lots of pictures of hospitality, right? These lavish yards with linens and it's, I'd like to eat there. But that's not what I mean by hospitality. It's not an, an exhibition of fine cutlery in China. By hospitality, what we mean is this effort to make room for others and then to nurture them, most basically by feeding them so that they can then be liberated to live into the fullness of their lives. This is what it means to talk about food as a gift versus food as a commodity. As a commodity, what you do is you take it and you sa save it for yourself, and then you eat it by yourself, or you eat it on the run, right? That's what fast food culture does. But if you think about food as a gift, you have to figure out, well, 
how do you become worthy of a gift, especially if the gift is as costly as it is, another's life? And what we learn is that the best way to become worthy of receiving the life of another is to turn your life into a gift to it. So to make this, I think, fairly clear, let me give you the example of my, my grandfather. This is one I mentioned to you who started farming in 1952 in Western Canada. He's probably one of the people who's been the most influential to me in my thinking about what does it mean to live responsibly in the world today? Today's chicken, the industrial chicken, is very different than my grandfather's chickens. Let's start with the industrial chicken. I don't want to, well, I could go for a half an hour about chickens, but I won't. <laughs> Today's industrial chicken lives a pretty miserable life. I'm assuming most of you know this. If you're going to be raised for meat, you will be genetically designed to produce big, big breasts because Americans and Canadians like white meat. And you will be engineered and fed a diet so that you can get to full slaughter weight in roughly 60% of the time. It's all in darkness, never see the sunshine. That's good because if you're thinking about chickens in terms of there being units of production, that's the ideal thing. If you're an egg-laying chicken, right, they're different, broilers versus hens, you're put in a cage that's basically the size of a filing cabinet drawer, but it's a mesh cage, and they're stacked on top of each other. And again, you don't ever get to see the sunshine. You don't ever get to peck or roam because your job is to be force-fed a diet that you produce eggs as much as possible. And you can imagine six chickens or eight chickens put in one of these mesh cages is incredibly stressful and the chickens will try to peck each other to death because they're so stressed out so they have to debeak them that's industrial chicken it's really egregious it's sacrilegious even but it makes perfect sense if you're thinking about chickens as commodities or units of production because units of production right we think about them in terms of efficiency maximization of yield. My grandfather didn't think about chickens as units of production. He thought about chickens as gifts from God. And if he was going to eat chicken, which he did, he also believed that he first needed to offer himself to the chickens in acts of love. And the way this worked out for him is that from spring until fall, roughly after lunchtime, he would get a scythe and a bucket and he would go somewhere in the yard and he'd cut down some grass that was maybe six inches tall, put it in the bucket and walk toward where the chickens were. And this had become a ritual because the chickens knew he was going to do this. And when they saw him coming with the bucket, they just came running and chickens can smile. Because my grandfather would throw the grass in the air and they would just jump for joy and eat the grass. Now I look at him doing this now and I say, why would you do that? Because these were free range chickens before that was a thing. They could get any grass they wanted. But my grandfather believed, like a host, that chicken happiness mattered. And so he believed that if he was going to eat the chickens, receive them as a gift, he needed to offer himself in acts of kindness and nurture. Acts that were completely unnecessary and from any business point of view, kind of foolish because farmers They've got more important things to do than create a little dancing session with chickens. But he believed that's what he should do. Now the question for us is, what, are, what could we possibly do? I don't imagine any of you are going to leave tonight and go get yourself a farm where you can dance with your chickens. But 
What do you do as a consumer of food to try to have a sense that the world is actually populated with gifts rather than commodities? Right? I think this might be one of the most important things we do because I believe that insofar as we can recover a sense of the world as gift, we might actually be able to put ourselves in a position to bring about some of the healing of our world, our lands, our waters, our agricultural communities, our neighborhoods. And the way it starts is by resisting the temptation to measure what happens in our world in terms of strictly efficiency, productivity. And as food consumers, right, I'm not saying you're going to stop being a food consumer. We're not going to get there. And we shouldn't because to eat, you consume. But as consumers, what you can do is you can start by trying to have a richer appreciation for the costliness of life. And this is something that's very difficult to pull off in a consumer food economy that is mostly anonymous, where you have no idea where the food is coming from. You have no idea under what conditions the food was produced, right? Was the land protected? Was water protected? Were farmers adequately compensated? Were food service providers given just living wage, right? All these kinds of things now come onto the table. And I don't suggest that you can do all of it at once, transform every shopping decision that you make. But start by thinking about some of the things that you eat regularly. Find out something about the history, right? Pull back the veil of ignorance that our anonymous economy has put up so that you can begin to appreciate what's actually happening in the life and the death that is the food that you eat. Second thing I tell people is once you start to do this research, you're going to learn a lot of things about the food system that you probably don't like. Because there's a lot of bad stuff going on in the food system. And the temptation is going to become, be the food police. Don't. Don't become the food police. Because people already have tremendous amounts of guilt in their lives. And in the food economies that many of us inhabit, it's going to be very difficult for us to make the choices that we might otherwise make. So the point is to try to figure out how to be a help to each other. Third thing I recommend you do is grow something. I don't expect that you're all going to have big gardens because you have to be really smart to do that. And most of us don't have that. In fact, I usually have students in my class on food and faith as part of what they do all semester long is they have to grow one green plant that we can then eat at the end of the semester together. By the end of the semester, maybe one or two students can bring in a few pieces for salad. That's it. Because the rest of them say, where do I find dirt? <laughs> Walmart, right? Where do I get seed? No idea. How far do I put the seed in the ground? You know, I learned some of them take tomato seed and they put it like two inches into the ground. Well, not gonna have germination there. And then they'll put water in it and they'll drown it or they'll forget water and kill it. And I asked them to keep a journal. And one of the things the students often say is they had no idea how easy it was to kill something. And the point is, they're not being malicious. Okay, we're not destroying the planet out of malice. Most often we're destroying the planet out of ignorance and negligence. And so one of the reasons I have people try to grow something is so you can come to understand something about your ignorance and your negligence, your impatience, right? I wanted the tomatoes in two weeks. It doesn't work that way. To be a gardener or a farmer is to mean now that your expectations for life are no longer your own. Your desire is not for yourself. It's for the well-being of your plants, for the well-being of your animals. It's a fundamentally different orientation. And I don't expect you're going to get all of that by growing one you know, spinach plant or something like that. But at least it will get you into a different kind of frame. And then the last thing I'll recommend briefly is if you don't have a lot of space yourself, 
Maybe you're in an apartment. I mean, you can still grow something in a pot by a window. But work together with your community members around something like a community garden. It's remarkable what community gardens do. The most important crop out of a community garden, by the way, is the community. Right? It's important for us to be with people around the effort of trying to provide sustenance for each other. Because then we learn something about our need of each other, how we can be a help to each other. And I think when we do these kinds of things, we put ourselves in a better position to be more honest about our dependence and our need, but also better position ourselves to be gifts to a world that was first gifted to us. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, I am Karen, uh, the third one introduced this evening. Uh, so thank you, Norman. I, um, it is a real privilege to be here, to think about these things. Uh, I have really enjoyed uh, many really grounding mornings these last few weeks, uh, reading Food and Faith with my tea uh, before anyone else in my household got up. Uh, and one thing I, I especially liked in Food and Faith, which I didn't hear you say tonight, but you do a lot in the book, is use the word delectable, which uh, I think we need more of that in our life. It's, it's more than just delicious, but it's also beautiful and nourishing us in different ways. But I guess the question I think about as I hear all of this is, does it really impact the way we eat? Does it really impact our food choices because really we are going to eat what's as you said what's convenient what we like what makes us feel good especially when we're exhausted or stressed or jet-lagged uh, or you know anything that we're in a state of low resilience so I think there are two factors that do impact what we eat and the first is who we live with um, or who we're hosted by when we're away from home uh, especially uh, if we, those we live with hold similar values and they carry their share of the shopping and the food prep and the dishes. Because uh, we know isolation is something that uh, is strongly correlated with being at a high risk of eating potato chips for dinner or corn pops. And I don't say this in judgment because I've done it. Um, but uh, those kind of patterns uh, do lead to some really poor health outcomes. Um, and here in Vancouver, more than 10% of us live alone, or 10% of our, our neighbors live alone. So who we live with really impacts what we eat. And the second thing that impacts is our income, which is very variable uh, and really inadequate for too many people. Um, but it's an important conversation, not what we're here to talk about today. So maybe I'll just offer one practice, which uh, I think many of us being steeped in hospitality, we do, and um, it's uh, called the division of responsibility. It refers um, to how we feed kids, which is this idea that uh, it is the parent or caregiver's responsibility uh, to figure out what food, get food gets in front of a kid. It's the kid's responsibility to decide what goes into their mouth. Uh, if you've spent any time with little kids, you know you're not going to put food, or you're not going to get them to eat what they don't want to eat. Um, so I propose that we do this a little bit more intentionally with the people that we have influence to feed or to share food with. Um, those in our shared homes, in our community programs. Uh, we need to honor the autonomy and independence of people. Um, but there are times where we need to put boundaries around what others eat. Uh, especially when people have a low income or uh, face some stresses, some traumas. Um, anything that would bring down their low resilience. 
Uh, one really cool story of this uh, it happens this evening, Thursday nights, as we've been gathering here. There's five churches that got together and run a community meal in Kitsilano, just down the hill, not far from us. It's not a part of the city with as much poverty as other parts, but there is a lot of isolation, there is some need, and there's not a lot of community supports in Kits. So a year ago, first week of November, uh, this meal launched, and it's a really beautiful example of the hospitality you were talking about. So uh, if that's something you want to see a little bit more in action, I'd certainly invite you to come and see that. Uh, my name is Andrea Parrott, uh, and uh, thank you, Norman, for the lecture. Um, I feel like we have this odd kinship uh, hailing from the same uh, corner of southern Alberta and having been to that farmer's market in the exhibition ground many times and thinking, yes, this is expensive. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with just a little bit of an introduction for how food and faith are intertwined in my own life. Um, and I am really, I love that you were talking about the division of food. And I was like, that's Ellen Sater, because this is a part of my life as a dietitian. And 10 years ago, if you told me I'd be speaking on food and theology, that's not where I thought I was heading. Um, I am a registered dietitian, uh, and I used to work in northern Alberta, particularly in Métis communities, where I started to get this idea that our spirituality has something to do with how and what we eat. So I really appreciate what you said as well, Karen, that it's who we're eating with and how much income we have. And I mean, most of us know what we should be eating and what we shouldn't be eating. And even if it's for the health or the moral or ethical reasons, we know this. But changing those behaviors uh, is a lot more complicated. And if it wasn't, we wouldn't have dietitians for jobs. Um, but in Northern Alberta, I found that like the presence of creator was so palatable and close to the surface. And people would say things like, well, when I'm not right with the creator, I don't eat right, my lifestyle isn't right. So that started to get me on, yeah, there's something about our spiritual health and our physical health. But then my uh, life uh, took a bit of a detour. I uh, ended up in seminary at that esteemed uh, institute Richard mentioned. Um, and I always thought I was going to be nutrition first and theology second, and God has funny ways, so I am now theology first and nutrition second. I'm a dietitian who doesn't really fit in with other dietitians. I'm kind of on the fringe of that. And I'm in ministry, but doesn't really fit in with all the other ministers. I'm also on the fringe of that. But I do feel at home in the garden and around the table sharing food. Although my one tomato plant that I grow every year on my tiny deck sometimes lives and sometimes dies. But I just wanted to raise uh, one and a half points uh, just from the lecture tonight um, and just thinking about how we guard against the commodification of food. So a lot of the work that I do now is with new worshiping communities or church planting. And I was looking at my bookshelf and not only is my collection, as I'm sure many of you else have these collections, are growing of food and faith books, but there's this particular section on my bookshelf of church plants that have to do with food and gardens and dinners. And I even look at kind of my own pathway and the uh, initiatives and experiments that I've been involved with so far have been St. Andrew's Community Table, the Breaking Bread Network, and the Rain City Baking Circle. Um, so they're all ending up in the realm of food. Um, and so one of the things that I think is happening in this is there's a recognition that there is this universality of food everyone eats. Uh, and so therefore, it's kind of this entry point into talking about some of the things that you were mentioning tonight about being generous. And it can cross those uh, secular spiritual uh, boundaries um, in a way that I think as witnessing communities we can speak into the commodification. However, I also worry that you know having a dinner church is just the next commodification, right? So how do we guard against that? How do we 
stop our human tendency, our human sinfulness of just wanting to industrialize and commodify and make everything as easy as possible. Um, because I do think that uh, the church gathering around food is a big part of not just the future of the church, but the future of the world, of slowing things down, um, of learning to treasure the gift of food. Um, this is why I host a baking circle where we take only two hours, so it's not a full loaf, but to actually bake the bread that we could easily buy at Cobb's down the street. Um, and so I'm curious to hear your ideas around what guards against us commodifying it and anyone else as well. But I just have this sneaky suspicion that it has something to do with the table and coming around uh, with communion, Holy Communion, and something that is so central to our faith and really one of the greatest gifts that we receive, the way that we are hosted by God. So that's my sneaky suspicion. I'm happy to chat with people later, but that's where I'll leave it. Thank you. Yeah, my name is uh, Trevor Malkinson. Um, I was, I'm now an ordained minister, but I was a chef for 20 years. Uh, and the food movement has been a big part of my life uh, for a long time. I mean, I remember when, uh, uh, Michael Pollan put out his book, Omnivore's Dilemma. I bought 14 copies and I gave them out to every friend I knew and two of them are now farmers actually. But um, anyway, th thank you, Norman. It's great to be with this uh, material. And I just, as I thought over this last week about uh, tonight, I was trying to think, what, you know, what, what's new for me around this? You know, what's new for me around this topic that I could add tonight? And I think, you know, something you said near the end of your talk was, are we destroying the world? We're not destroying the world out of malice. And I'm actually, I'm going to challenge that a little bit because I'm wondering, I love this book, Food and Faith is so great because you, you deploy so much theology and theological concepts to look at our relationship to food. But one of them um, that's not in there is, is looking at uh, uh, the food system as demonic or the food system as the beast system, right? So sim these are some of the things I was thinking about this week. I mean, we know now that Monsanto has lost two cases now in the Roundup, but for years and years and years, they beat everybody down. They said this was a cancerous uh, entity. Uh, you know, they hired Blackwater to go after activists, you know, mercenary group uh, to go after farmers. That's pretty dark. We know about ag-gag laws and, you know, how you can't even film inside these horrific, uh, you know, factory farms. And if you just think about the factory farms just to even look like, or I think back to some old pictures of, of the old whaling ships where all that blood would be flowing out of the front. Or if you think about uh, the violence of bottom trawlers, you know, just tearing the ocean up and all that stuff that's caught in it. Uh, we know now that uh, from the book, I think his name is Michael Moss, but salt, salt sugar, fat, that the corporations, uh, uh, corporate leaders understood that sugar was extremely damaging, but they hid this fact. They didn't care. Uh, we go on and on all night with that kind of thing. Uh, we learn more and more about the, the, the elites who run this world and the things they're into. Uh, Epstein didn't kill himself. And um, so there's a system there. I'm wondering about sort of the principalities and powers and Paul and his use of, you know, that. And, and, and you know, I worry that all these things that... It's amazing, we have, you know, getting back to planting and cooking and eating the table and eating together, these are very important things in the us and we, they need to be done. But I think we're dealing with something much darker, actually, that has, it is, has control of that system. And I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Okay. So is, it, is this working? Can you hear me? Okay. Is this working now? Yes? Oh, good. So first of all, thank you for taking the time to, to engage with me. Uh, I think I'll start from the back and move up. Uh, so Trevor, yeah, absolutely, I think you're right. Uh, there's always the question about how quickly you get to the dem demonic uh, in a presentation like this, because otherwise <laughs> it's a pretty big downer, <laughs> you know? So. 
I think when I was saying that, that most of us are not going to be malicious, we're mostly ignorant, I'm thinking about the perspective of the consumer. And, and this actually becomes a part of the demonic side of our food system because so much that's happening in our food system, the providers of that food, they do not want you to know what's happening. Right? So it's, it's to their bottom line to make sure you don't know what's happening. And so if you, like one of the things I have students do in my class besides try to grow a plant is I try to get them to do research on one of their favorite foods so they can find out its history. And usually what happens is students start the class by saying, do you have any idea how hard it is to find out the history of the food I like? You can't find out. Like if a kid eats Doritos, there's no way to know. How did that Dorito come to be? Because either you call the customer service number and you just get a computer, or if you finally do reach a person, they're going to say, I don't know, corn. Well, what corn? Corn. I mean, there's just no answer. And so there's no accountability in this system that's anonymous. And so companies get away with all kinds of things. So I would say absolutely the system and the people controlling the levers of the system, I would say absolutely it's demonic. And the way this has become especially egregious is in the ownership of life, right? In the patenting of life forms. This is, this is utterly utterly evil, I think, because people have figured out that you can live without oil. You cannot live without food. And so there's a very good reason for why major corporations trying to control the food system. Because if they can control that, if they can control farmers, if they can control what eaters get, you've got it all. And so that's pretty clear that that's been going on. And then the, the examples that you gave, absolutely, I would agree with you that there's a whole bunch of activity here that Paul's language of principalities and powers would be very appropriate to deploy. I think one thing I would say too is, you know, Augustine has this wonderful line that, which says the punishment of a disordered mind is its own disorder. And I think what's happened is that for a lot of us, we're so wrapped in this system of, of food that has been reduced to a commodity, we don't even appreciate it for what it is. And so the relationships that we have with everything have become so disordered that we can't see that eating that we do as anything but normal and, and the regular course of things. Um, so the question is going to be, how do we shock ourselves out of this? And I think as church people, what we do is we try to look at the system through the lens of Jesus' life uh, and discover that there can be a radically different way of imagining what it means to receive each other, what it means to receive the gifts of the world. And that becomes the basis, I think, for a, a radical rethinking. Um, you know, the roots of where it goes wrong can be pointed at in very different places, but the commodification of food is certainly one of them. So yeah, it's a great point, Trevor, and that's, that's sort of how I go. So Andrew, your question is, how do we guard against commodification? Um, it's a really good question. and. and because I've been around the food movement for now, I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay, these things become commodified pretty, pretty quickly. And, and I think one of the best ways to do that is to be confronted with your own ignorance and need. That becomes one of the primary ways to, to stop the commodification process. And that's going to mean, at least in the food space and in the community space, so that even if you're thinking about something like dinner churches, uh, dinner churches can be pretty quickly a display about who's got the best cooking techniques, who's got the best dishes, who's got it all put together. And I think finding ways as a leader of a community like that to, to keep the vulnerability very visible, to keep the ignorance very visible is really, really important. And that means becoming rather uncomfortable with ourselves. And. And there's a lot of ways that that happens, right? One of them is you don't just sort of go to the store to get the stuff that you put in a, commod in a, in a, a, a church dinner or something like that. But you actually try to work with people together. You start cooking together. You, you make yourself receptive to the way other people imagine a food space or a particular food item that you're going to eat. And, you know, this, this, is a, this is a highly instructive thing to do. Have you ever been in a kitchen with someone who cooks very differently than you? Right? Kitchens can be places where there is like 
I won't say demonic exercise of power, <laughs> but it's intense. I mean, super intense. And so simply to open up your kitchen to somebody else, I mean, I'd be terrified to cook with you, man, because you've been a chef for 20 years. You tell me everything. I don't even crack eggs properly. Right? And so the exercises that we can do together that help us see the need for some humility and the need to accept the gifts from others, even if you don't want them, I think, I think that's an important part uh, that can help stop this or guard against some of the commodification. Um, Karen, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just pick the one here because I want to get people on the floor here time to ask some questions too. Uh, your question about um, how income affects how and what we eat. This is, this is a really, really enormous question and it's absolutely important to have. And I think one of the ways we talk about this has to get to the level of policy, food policy. And you know, I don't know enough about how food policy, ag policy works in Canada anymore, but you know, at least in the United States, there's no question that food policy as it's established in, in government has had an incredible damaging effect on what people eat, what they're able to eat, who they eat with, when they eat, because the system is thoroughly stacked to make sure that food is only a commodity and the food that is produced is going to be unhealthy. It'll be cheap, but it'll be very unhealthy. And this becomes a policy for poverty that then is tied very closely to sickness and ill health. And so people, you know, when, I, when they hear me talk, they often say, so you're a proponent of expensive food, right? Like the solution is to go to Whole Foods. Absolutely not. That's not a solution. Because first of all, to go to Whole Foods, you have to drive a Prius. <laughs> I mean, why would you do that? That's no good. And then secondly, why is it a solution to say that we should keep food cheap and therefore consign poor people to ill health? That's not doing poor people a favor. The thing to do is to make good food priced like cheap food is today. And that's a policy decision, folks. Because right now, why are potato chips cheaper than a potato? That just doesn't make any sense. But it makes perfect sense if you're in the commodities business. And they're driving the show in the United States. And so it would be interesting to hear how the story is playing itself out in Canada. Um, but the question of poverty and income levels is a really, really important one. But to get there, I think you have to talk about uh, the policies that are driving our food system, that are also determining where grocery stores go, how fac or uh, farmers markets can be set up for people to access, and all those kinds of things. So let's stop there and then have time now for people to ask questions. Uh, just before we move to questions, let's say thank you to our panelists for this evening. Mm -hmm. So are there questions, please? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going veering left a little bit here. Um, for the past 10 years, I've worked in a ministry that is centered around hospitality and feeding people and eating together. And that's been a very healing thing in my life. And I've seen it be a very healing thing for other people as you guys have commented on. I'm wondering if you could just comment a little bit on, um, I'm also American, so I'm coming from the States. Um, a trend around, um, I don't know how to say this, uh, like people making very specific dietary and food choices. Um, so we have obviously an increase in very legitimate food allergies in people who are using diet to control health issues and that's all very legitimate. I'm thinking more about people who are saying, oh, well, I don't eat that or I only eat this way or I'm eating this very specific diet and how that intersects with hospitality, with being able to feed other people and to be able to receive what people are offering us. Just if you have any thoughts on that. That's great. I'm not a dietitian. <laughs> yeah, it is true. There are um, a lot of people who have food intolerances, but the more simple, basic food we, we offer, we share, uh, you know, if we cook that potato instead of 
the potato chips with all the seasonings, more people can likely eat it. Uh, there's a, a food writer, Mark Winnie, and he says, the rich get local and organic, the poor get diabetes. Um, so food quality uh, is something we need to think of. But again, um, your question is, how do we accommodate? Uh, So when we define health as what is healthy for my body, my stomach, my arteries, uh, then we will be quite individualistic. When we define health as what is, who are the people around me, who's at my table, uh, then some of those individualistic choices fade um, and sharing becomes more important. Can I add to that? Sure. Um, I would just add that, uh, especially if it's part of a witnessing community of Christians coming together, that yes, there is an element of accommodating those who are around the table, but also this demonstration of what it means to eat what is put in front of you, right? So if you have leaders who are saying, well, I won't eat this and I won't eat that, then that will be reflected in those who gather as well. Um, but I think, yeah, also increasing people's tolerance to receive hospitality is part of it as well. A question here. Hi, thanks for the lecture. Just wondering if you uh, know of or um, are inspired by any other countries or regions around the world that you think are doing a better job uh, in this than North America and examples of how they are doing things better. Uh, well, Canada has just put out a new food guide which is making some good shifts towards um, focusing less on what we eat uh, and more on who's at our table cooking but I think we took a lot of inspiration from Brazil and Brazil has probably got one of the best food guides in the world so something to look up today. Uh. I think we need to learn from indigenous communities, and I mean this in the very broad sense. So I have a student right now from Ghana, wonderful guy, Jackson Adama, who is constantly telling me about his food culture, the one he grew up with. And, and what was so beautiful about it is this was very much a conception of food as a social reality and not an individual choice. And so the idea, and this relates to the, the, to the first question here, what do we think food is supposed to be? Insofar as we think of it as a commodity or as a fuel to keep our individual bodies or machines at maximum productivity, then yeah, you, you are gonna make all kinds of decisions. I want this diet because this will optimize this or that thing I'm trying to work on or something like that. But if you start by thinking about food as a social reality or to use the language that students will start to use at the end of the semester, food is fellowship. Right? If you think that when you come to a meal that the most important thing is not to fuel your machine but to participate in fellowship, if that's what food is, right, then you start to think very different about the whole enterprise. And then what you're doing is you're coming to the gathering to contribute, not simply to take. And so the culture of sharing that Jackson says is just paramount in his culture is utterly beautiful. Right? So it's a communal sharing activity that builds the community rather than an individual fueling session. Right? And that's just one example of, of someone from Ghana who comes from a culture very different than our own. Question here. Um, thank you, Norman, for the lecture. Um, we just talked about factors that influence um, the way we eat, and I totally agree that community and income are two very important factors. I would like to add another one and hear your thoughts on it, and that's time. Um, I feel like 
I mean, we talked about fast food, but like preparing food and even one, some of your suggestions, growing food and getting to know the food system, that all requires time. How do we make time in a world that tells us we don't have time for anything? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And you know the direction of food is going where uh, you can now get food in little bottles. So you, there's no preparation, there's no enjoyment, and there's no cleanup. So food has become virtually irrelevant. It, it doesn't even appear in time, right? That's an amazing development, but it follows the logic of a commodity culture that we're in. Uh, so yeah, your point about time is absolutely spot on. I think in my own life, I am not a perfect eater, okay, just not by a long shot. And I can tell you almost every time I make a bad decision, it's because I didn't have time. It's huge. And, and it, it's, it, it relates also to the question of money. Uh, people say we don't have money and we don't have time. And, and I think the two go together because I think what we have to ask ourselves is what do we want to do with our time and our money? And we're not very good ledger keepers, but if we did, what I, I encourage, and I, you know, I need to apply this to myself from time to time, is just take a piece of paper and keep track of what am I doing with my day. And depending on the week, you know, you, you could have spent, you know, 60 hours in hell because it was committee meetings the whole week. Okay, is that a good use of time? Maybe not. Or if you're on social media, you know, you discover it's four hours a day or whatever it is your people do, okay? So that's one thing about the time, is just get clear on where you're spending your time because you may discover you're actually putting your commitments to things you really wouldn't want to commit if you had the longer view. Because when you add up four hours a day over a lifetime, it's like, what, 10 years of your life you spent on Facebook? When you could have been cooking and eating with people you love? And it's a very different way of thinking about our time. And it also applies to money, right? We spend relatively little on food today compared to the history of the world. And that's also something that we could talk about if you wanted to. I, I appreciated the uh, discussion of food as commodity and, and, and especially as gift, which evokes hospitality and gratitude. Um, I'm wondering if any of you have any comments on food as a human right, adequate, nutritious food as a basic human right and how that affects how we as people of faith behave toward food. Okay, I'll try. Um, yeah, I think scripture gives us warrant for thinking this sort of way because God gets really mad when people can't eat. In fact, one of the signs of God's wrath is to be a people who God sees as not feeding the people who are hungry. So I think from a scriptural point of view, you could certainly say that food isn't optional for people. It's something they simply must have. It's, it's like the bare minimum that needs to be provided for. I mean, there are other things in scripture that relate to this, including access to land. This was very also, also very important to ancient Israel because access to the sources of one's livelihood is not just the basis for your own life, it's also the basis for any future hospitality you might extend to others. And I think also when you look at not just you know Judaism and Christianity, but other religious traditions, the place of hospitality in their teaching is also, I think, highly indicative because the assumption is, is that when someone shows up at your door, the first thing you're supposed to do is feed them. Because the assumption is that everybody eats and everybody should eat. And so that should be the first thing that you attend to. Now, it doesn't carry the language of rights as it's been developed in modern political discourses, but I think the idea is still there in these traditions that one of the worst things that you can do as the follower of a faith tradition is to say to somebody else who's hungry, I won't feed you. Jason. Um, I guess I just want to, uh, you, you mentioned at the beginning the, the Green Revolution and, and how it was absolutely, um, 
there's a whole lot of positive uh, things to say about the Korean Revolution. So I guess I just want to raise a um, uh, one cheer for commoditization, right? So the the getting people off the land and away from producing food has freed up enormous amounts of social, economic, artistic uh, creativity, right? So is there, is there danger in, in this kind of push back to the land? Are we, um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. No, yeah, I hear what's you. Your, and, yeah, what's your thesis? Like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. so it's, your, your, your question's a really good one and it would require a complex answer, which I can't give you right now, so I'll just be very crass in general. First of all, I would never advocate a back to the land movement because most people aren't smart enough to farm. Okay, and that goes directly against the caricature of farmers as dim-witted, right? To be a good farmer requires an incredibly complex intelligence, a wide range of skills that take years and communities to develop, and a temperament that most people simply don't have. So I would never advocate a back to the land. I would advocate we need more people on the land because if we're gonna feed people on soils that are fertile, we need to have more intensive agricultural practice because right now agriculture is developed to suit machines rather than people. And so what I would argue is that, yeah, we're gonna need more people on the land, but there's a lot of hipsters who wanna farm now. And the trouble is, is they can't get access to land. And so if we could make it possible for them to farm, I think that would be a good thing. So I'm not talking about a back to the land movement. I'm also not about turning back the clock, right? So when people hear me, critique the Green Revolution, they're saying, oh, he wants to go back to 40 bushels an acre. Well, no, not at all, because we've got lots now of experience and scientific help understanding what natural systems agriculture can do. And natural systems agriculture can now produce yields that rival Green Revolution yields that are actually declining, because what the Green Revolution is doing is it's trying to increase yields, right? There are people who say we need to take corn from 250 to 500 bushels an acre because you know, 10 or 11 people are coming, right? We're not that far away from 10 or 11 billion people. And the people who understand food production systems are telling us there has never been a challenge for civilization like that. How are we gonna feed all those people? And so they're talking about increasing corn yields to 500 bushels an acre. That's crazy, because they're trying to do it on soils that are further exhausted, needing fresh water that is not gonna be available all in a warming planet. That ain't a solution. So what we need to do is we need to first of all figure out how we're gonna build soil, soil fertility, and that means returning organic matter to the soil, increasing the microbial life that's happening in soil. And if we can do that, I mean, there's even questions about carbon sequestration that can happen if we do proper soil management. So I would say the solution is not to turn back the clock and not to turn people back onto the land in mass numbers. Uh, and I also don't want to deny the fact that agricultural communities historically have not always been pleasant places, right? They've been closed-minded, they've been xenophobic, there's been all kinds of trouble, very suspicious of outsiders. But one thing to understand in defense of these communities is that the history of agriculture is the history of exploitation of landed peoples by unlanded peoples. And so when someone came to your farming village, they did not come to do you a favor. They came to exploit you, and that's part of the reason why farmers have been so suspicious of outsiders. Just one of the, the reasons, I would say. So I have a, a question which may be a little bit combination of cynicism and Pollyannaism. So um, is there a role for choice, so consumer choice? Because if I look at, so um, two things that have happened over the years. Um, that there are now much more wider availability of different types of eggs. 15 years ago in British Columbia, you could not get organic eggs. So, but because people started making a choice at the supermarket to buy them, they're now more available. I know there are other dynamics at work. As well as then organic food. The organic food aisles in, and it's not, you know, it's just save on, it's not, you know, whatever. And I, yeah, I drive my Prius to save on. I don't hate Prius. Yeah. 
but is there a role for actually making choices? Because the more choices, so I, so I have a little money, I can buy organic food, but that actually makes it more available because more of us make choices to have it. So does, is there, and so then my cynical side says, nah, that's not actually gonna work because all the you know corporations are just gonna take advantage of it. But is there a role for how we make choices when we buy food, to buy organic, to buy, does that make any difference at all in how we're gonna you know, make more food available? I think the chef should answer this one. Well, I would say absolutely it does. The choice uh, um, makes a big difference. And so, I mean, something Michael Pollan would say is we get to vote with our fork three times a day. And so there is uh, very few things I think we get passionate about where we actually can affect the growth of new food systems through our choices, our dollars. And, you know, the it has so many things has changed. As, as you said, I've watched it over the years, too, uh, even in, in Walmart and Costco bringing in more of these products because people are buying them and wanting them. And the growth of, of farmers markets across North America is just astronomical because people are, are, are buying, you know, are putting their money there. Uh, the, the, the growth of local uh, locally raised meat. Uh, is, is also all that's really growing off the the backs of, of, of choice so I think this is one of the things one of the rare kind of things uh, where we can actually affect it quite strongly quite quickly actually let me just add one other thing too we have to be very s careful to not go for purity okay so if you say, okay, if, if I start buying organic, then organic standards are going to be corrupted because everyone wants to get on the game. Yeah, that'll probably happen. But is purity the goal? We're never going to get purity. But instead, can we move the needle in a certain direction? That, that would be great. Okay, friends, one more question here, I think. And uh, the, the, the students and faculty of VST get another chance tomorrow. So I haven't forgotten you. You will have a chance. Thank you. Uh, you've talked, a, I'm starting to get a feel for how uh, this idea of food being a gift can be a healing thing for planet, for us personally. Could you maybe speak a bit more to that on an individual level for people who ex associate food with some sort of trauma or an un unhealthy family dynamics around food or, or um, maybe an eating disorder or things like that? Oh boy, yeah, that's, that's a really, good and hard, hard question. And um, it's, it's hard to speak in general terms about it uh, because the histories that people bring to eating are so, so complex and very individualized, okay? So, you know, you think about how persons grow up in, in a home that had all sorts of dynamics about it that, that created all sorts of food issues, if you want to use that kind of language. And, you know, I'm not a person who's in the best position to figure all those things out. I don't, I don't try to be a food counselor to, to students or people because, you know, so much of that, some of the eating disorders, I mean, these are complex conditions that need professional training. And so I recommend strongly, and I say this to people who are going to be pastors too, I mean, don't think that as a pastor you read a book on food that you can now be a counselor to people whose people are dealing with anorexia or something like this. You need professional help for that. Um, but yeah, th then the question becomes, well, what are some of the issues at play? And I'm going to speak just more generally because I don't want to get to an individual case. But it's very clear that there are all kinds of even spiritual damaging dimensions to this so that we know that there are people uh, who've had positions of religious leadership where they've equated thinness with virtue. And so, you know, I, I just know of so many young women who have been damaged by youth pastors who've said, you're fat and God doesn't like fat women. And you think, my goodness, what is this about, right? And so you, you end up having to get to a conversation about embodiment. And what is embodiment about? What does that really get to? I mean, there's a lot of critical discourses around the body, but it's very abstract. And what I want to help people understand is that, that something about the affirmation of bodies is at the very heart of any gospel articulation of life insofar as we first of all believe that the fullness of God dwelled in the body of Jesus, right? So bodies are never the problem for a Christian, or at least they shouldn't be, but we've often made it out to be that way because there's all sorts of Gnostic heretical tendencies within Christian teaching. So speaking within a church context, we have to figure out what does it mean 
to try to esteem bodies as the gifts of God that are to be cherished and nurtured and cared for. And how all of those things can be disordered, yeah, lots of ways, because our loves are so often disordered. Right? There's questions about ego, there's questions about power and manipulation. I know this isn't answering your direct question, and it, partly it is, I, I don't know that I want to try to answer it directly because I think it just takes so much time to understand why a person has a particular relationship to the foods that they have real trouble with. Right? So ex one example, I had a student come to do a thesis project with me at Duke on food. And she said, you know, Wurzba, I really liked your book, but I'm, I'm, I'm gluten intolerant. And so your stuff on bread, I just couldn't take it. I thought, oh, I was so proud of that section. <laughs> and then we started to talk a little bit about it. And, and it was clear to me that she was coming from a place that I had not even imagined, right, because of her own health conditions, but also the context in which she grew up. And so something like a general food prescription, it's really difficult to just pull off, I think. I mean, maybe somebody else can. I don't know. I mean, the one, two cents for folks who, you know, don't know this material. I mean, you know, uh, it's something that's come out of various researchers over the last, you know, decade as well, is that this recognition that we were evolutionarily hardwired for salt, sugar, and fat, and that, um, you know, and it was usually in low supply in our evolution. So um, we would eat as much of it as possible. And so food corporations know this and that a lot of the food they make is, is just jam-packed with those things. So there's a bit of, uh, I guess, uh, well, just knowledge of that is good as well. There's a, a book as well I was just recently turned on to called The Dorito Effect. And I was talking to Norman about it. But, you know, uh, science figured out in the 50s how to mimic flavor. And we have a lot of signals of what that flavor means flavor for us if we don't back in the day if we had a flavorful tomato that meant it had nutrition so science has figured out that oh so we have we eat these fake food basically and they've separated um basically don't eat anything with natural flavor on the box that's a lie that's science and it's tricking our olfactory into eating everything in that bag or that whatever so there's a little bit of defense we can gain these days of what we're discovering i think it helps a little bit um, I'll just kind of add to both of you. Uh, so what Trevor's describing, the fancy word for uh, an environment that makes us want to eat everything is obesogenic. Um, and so it means our built environment, our food environment, everything is programming us to want to eat as much as we can. And that food that tastes really, really good, um, that generally isn't good for us. Uh, so I think not dealing specific issues, but often, like broadly speaking, our environment is what is responsible for a lot of our disordered eating. And so uh, if we're looking at switching from food as a commodity to food as a gift, I think you know there is hope that that can start to switch kind of the environment um, that we exist in with food. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Karen. New friend for us here at Vancouver School of Theology. Thank you for being back with us again. And thank you for sharing. Um, you know, you're so well informed on these things, Trevor. It was, it was great for me to see you answer one of your professor's questions. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you very much. And thank you, Norman, for being with us tonight and for provoking uh, uh, a great discussion that we're bringing to an end. It feels like it could go on much longer. Um, thank you for your uh, uh, direct and clear conversational uh, engagement with us. I think with, that we've all become uh, more intelligent about these matters, and you've encouraged us with new practices, so that's uh, especially delightful. And thank you all for being with us this evening here at the Vancouver School of Theology. It's been a pleasure to host you.